Welcome back. Good to see you all again. Today we're going to talk about Roe v. Wade, the 1973 decision by the U.S. Supreme Court that guaranteed the right for a person to have an abortion. It didn't just make it legal to have an abortion. It said that it was a constitutional right and that Congress nor the state could make any law that unduly or unnecessarily abridge that constitutional right. And so it fits into one of the themes of this course, which is the gradual expansion of our individual and personal rights. Uh, the right to free speech, the right to a free press, the right to have a lawyer if you get arrested. They're gradually being expanded. And usually it's by looking at the Constitution and saying, how do we interpret this in ways that fit the modern age? Especially the Fifth Amendment that says nobody should be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. That clause, due process of law, allows a lot of expansion over the years. And then the 14th Amendment, which also says that you can't be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, but says it applies it to the states as well as to the federal government. Well, this is a case in which there's not a very specific right in the Constitution but as the rights get expanded by the Supreme Court, it includes a new right that they enumerate, which is the right to privacy, which guarantees the right of a woman to have an abortion. It begins back in the sort of 1870s when a crusader against vice and pornography and contraception, a guy named Anthony Comstock, uh, goes around in crusades for a set of laws that become known as the Comstock Laws. The very first one, here's a quote from it. You can tell that he's kind of against uh, anything that might be lascivious or lewd. So he says, every obscene, lewd, or lascivious, and every filthy book or pamphlet or picture or paper or letter, or writing, print, or any other publication of an indecent character. In other words, porn and also anything that is intended uh, to prevent conception, i.e. contraceptives, or abortion. None of that, he says, shall be conveyed in the mails. Well, that meant you couldn't advertise or do anything in the mails, but eventually this gets expanded, and the Comstock laws pretty much outlaw everything from contraception to pornography, and eventually get expanded so uh, they apply to abortion. Uh, Margaret Sanger, the great founder of uh, the great uh, founder of Planned Parenthood, the person who fights for so much, including uh, 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 birth control, uh, she challenges, she makes it her mission to challenge these Comstock acts. And she opens the first birth control clinic in America in 1916. And she gets arrested for doing so. And this leads to one of the first court decisions that strikes down things like bans on birth control as being bad for the individual rights. It's called the Crane decision, and it allows women to use birth control for therapeutic purposes for the first time. But as the Comstock laws are being passed, you're seeing a whole set of laws that are intended to restrain and constrain uh, lascivious behavior. They're intended to impose morality as opposed to leaving uh, decisions like that to personal choice. Uh, the Catholic Church banned abortion in 1869. And by 1880, uh, it's outlawed in almost every part of the United States. In fact, until 1970, every state had some severe restrictions on abortion. In 1970, Hawaii and New York legalized abortion. Uh, and by the time of Roe v. Raid in 1973, 
it's only four places it's legal, which is Hawaii, New York, Alaska, and Washington State. But these laws, beginning with the Comstock laws, were passed in sort of a fit of public morality overtaking private liberties and private rights. It was in England called the Victorian period because Queen Victoria was there. And for reasons that I can't fully explain, around the globe in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s, there was a return to very traditional morality, a Victorian age, a prudishness. That's what we always associate the Victorian age with. And in America, we associate it with the Comstock laws, bans on pornography, bans on birth control, and bans on abortion. This the, begins to be challenged in the 1960s. If there's ever a period that's different from a Victorian era, it's the 1960s in America, a time in which people uh, celebrated the idea of sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and free sex, and that notion of the prudishness that had been imposed upon us, starting with the Victorian period and the Comstock laws, is under assault. And what happens is a woman named Estelle Griswold, you see her there at the Planned Parenthood Center of New Haven that she ran, she fights the law against contraception. She takes on Connecticut's Comstock law that prohibits the use of contraceptives. And she argues that it violates her personal rights. And Justice William Douglas, Supreme Court, writes for the 72, 72 majority of the Supreme Court, writes a case about the right to marital privacy. He overturns the ban on contraception in the case called Griswold v. Connecticut. And in doing it, the justice finds a right to privacy that he says exists in the penumbras and emanations of other constitutional protections, such as the Fifth Amendment. Uh, among those voting with him are Justice Arthur Goldberg, and he writes a concurring opinion saying it's also part of the penumbra or the uh, emanation of the Ninth Amendment. And you have Justices White and Harlan also saying, and the 14th Amendment. What they're doing is they're saying, it's, there's no real right to privacy in the Constitution. You can make fun of them for looking at all these amendments and trying to figure out where to find a right to privacy. But what they're trying to say is all these other rights we have, the free speech, freedom of religion, whatever it may be, those imply that we have some right to personal privacy. And without that right to autonomy, to privacy. None of these other rights can really be exercised. And so they called it part of the penumbra, part of the emanation, meaning if you believe in all these other constitutional rights, you gotta give a person a right to privacy. And that will lead us to our next lecture, which is how does this apply to Roe v. Wade? Even if you agree that there's a right to privacy, that undergirds all of our other constitutional rights, you might say, okay, but explain to me, how does that affect the question of whether a state can ban or not ban abortion?